Good evening, everyone. Let's get started, please. It's wonderful to see so many people here tonight uh, for this third night of the Lake Forest College Literary Festival. Uh, for some of you in the back, um, there are a few seats left up here in the front, three if you uh, decide you want to come closer. My name is Carla Arnell, and I'm chair of the English department. Uh, the week-long literary festival has been a big success this week with different literary delights for everyone, I think. <laughs> Uh, the festival will conclude tomorrow evening with a Tusitala launch party in Calvin Duran Lounge at 730 p.m. And that party will be a celebration of the latest issue of our literary journal, Tusitala, with readings and performances by our staff and contributors. I hope everyone can make it out for one more evening uh, for this finale of the literary festival. Tonight, though, we are delighted to feature of the celebrated translator Stanley Lombardo performing and discussing Homer's Odyssey. Lombardo uh, is Professor Emeritus of Classics at the University of Kansas, a native of New Orleans. He has a BA from Loyola University in New Orleans, an MA from Tulane University, and a PhD from the University of Texas. He is best known for his translations of Greek and Latin poetry, including Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid and Ovid's Metamorphoses. He has also ventured into other linguistic territory. He recently translated Dante's Divine Comedy, as well as the ancient epic of Gilgamesh, which is soon to be published. Professor Lombardo also maintains an interest in Asian philosophy and has co-authored a translation of Tao Te Ching and co-edited an anthology of Zen texts. For this, his many accomplishments as a translator, he was in uh, 2010 awarded the Umhofer Humanities Award. Lombardo's Homeric translations are known for what one critic called their distinctive speed, clarity, and boldness. A New York Times review of his Iliad translation highlighted Lombardo's insistence that any translation for a contemporary audience must be, quote, a performance on the page for the silent reader, end quote. Tonight, we have the opportunity not to read Professor Lombardo's textual performance, but to see and hear him perform Homer live. The title of his performance is Odysseus's Homecoming. He will be performing and discussing books 22 and 23 of the Odyssey. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lombardo. Carla said, this is primarily a um, dramatic reading of um, the end of book 22, uh, actually, and uh, just about all of book 23, when Odysseus finally arrives home. The Odyssey is, in fact, a homecoming home. It's what the Greeks called a nostos, which means a return home. And uh, that word is actually very closely related to the Greek word for mind, noos. It's an Indo-European root, ness, that means return from darkness to light. And that's what Odysseus does in both senses. That is, he is uh, hidden you know, for seven years on the island of uh, Calypso, uh, who's uh, really enchanted with him and doesn't want to let him go. It's a marvelous scene when you know, she finally tells him, all right, you can go, but do you, do you really want to? You could stay here with me and be immortal and ageless all of your days. What would you say to Calypso at that point? Odysseus, always thinking, says one of his epithets, polymetes, many, many thoughts. He's always ready for any occasion. And this might be a very difficult situation for him. If you've ever left someone who didn't want you to leave, you know what I'm talking about. So he says this to her. Goddess and mistress, don't be angry with me. 
I know very well that Penelope would pale beside you. She's only human, and you're a goddess, eternally young. Still, I want to go home. My heart aches for the day I return to my home. If some god hits me hard as I sail the deep purple, I'll bear it like the sea bit and salt that I am. God knows I've suffered, and I had my share of sorrows in war and at sea. I can take more if I have to. And I make love that night for the last time, and then he's off on a raft in his struggle to return home. He faces many adversities. He meets them all with a mind that is flexible, ready for any twist of fate. He can get out of seemingly any situation, no matter how difficult. It is by virtue of his incredible mind that he finally arrives back at Ithaca, where the goddess Pallas Athena meets him. She really admires Odysseus for his mind. She says to him, here we are, Odysseus, the two shrewdest minds in the universe. You among mortals and I among the immortals. And they work out a plan. They are improvising, which is one of the themes of this conference. Athena disguises him as an old, worn out beggar, broken down old guy, begging for his bread. And he comes home in that disguise. His house is besieged by 108 young men flower of Ithaca, who are trying to marry his wife Penelope, kill his son, and they're basically eating him out of house and home. They don't treat Odysseus very well at all, not observing any of the laws of hospitality. He puts up with all of their abuse. Penelope notices the old guy, of course, and wants to talk to him. So they have a meeting late at night with all of the maid servants around, watching, some of them treacherous. They're sleeping with the suitors, some of them. And so Odysseus and Penelope, Odysseus especially, has to guard his words. And the way he handles himself in that difficult situation is more evidence of the power of his mind and his presence of mind. In that late night talk, Penelope announces that she is going to propose a contest with Odysseus' bow, his old bow that he didn't take to Troy. Whoever can string that bow, whoever amongst the suitors can string the bow and shoot an arrow through a row of nine axes through the socket, all lined up like a big tube. And she says, I, I'll go with him, whoever he is. And Odysseus says, this is a very good plan. And he knows that once that bow in, is in his hands, then it's all over for the suitors. And he does get the bow in his hands. And with the help of Pallas Athena and his son Telemachus and two faithful servants, he kills all 108 of the suitors. We are picking up the scene where he's actually killed them all at the end of Book 22. Stanley, sorry, before you start, I can't hear in the back. Are we able to turn up the... the, the can the volume be increased? Or should I just be talking I think if louder? you could do a little louder, that'd be great. You're com about, this part is good, but you're competing against something in the back. So. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can... So where are you who can't hear me so well? That's much better. Is this much better? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry you missed everything I said. It's not important. <laughs> What's important is what Homer says. Odysseus has just killed in his hall the 108 arrogant young men. And they're strewn all over the place. The blood and dust. The whole lot of them. And Odysseus called to his son, Telemachus. Go call 
My old nurse, Eurycleia, for me. I want to tell her something. So Telemachus went to Eurycleia's room, rattled the door, and called, Get up and come out here, old woman. You were in charge of all our women servants. Come on. My father has something to say to you. Eurycleia's response died on her lips. She opened the doors to the great hall, came out, and followed Telemachus to where Odysseus, spattered with blood and grime, stood among the bodies of the slain. A lion that has just fed upon an ox in a field has his chest and cheeks smeared with blood, and his face is terrible to look upon. So too Odysseus, smeared with gore from head to foot. When Eurycleia saw all the corpses and the pools of blood, she lifted her head to cry out in triumph. But Odysseus stopped her cold, reining her in with these words, Rejoice in your heart, but do not cry aloud. It is unholy to gloat over the slain. These men have been destroyed by divine destiny and their own recklessness. I honor no one, rich or poor, high or low, who came to them, and so by their folly they have brought upon themselves an ugly fate. Now tell me, which of the women in my household dishonor me, and which are innocent? And you reclaim the loyal nurse. Yes, indeed, child, I will tell you all. There are 50 women in your house, servants we have taught to do their work, to card will bear all the drudgery. Of these, 12 have shamed this house and respect neither me nor Penelope herself. Telemachus has only now become a man and his mother has not allowed him to direct the women servants. May I go now to the upstairs room and tell your wife some god has wrapped her up in sleep? Odysseus, his mind teeming, answered her. Don't wake her yet. First bring those women who have acted so disgracefully. While the old woman went out through the hall to tell the women the news, to summon twelve of them. Odysseus called Telemachus and the two herdsmen and spoke to them words fletched like arrows. Start carrying out the bodies and have the women help you. Then sponge down all the beautiful tables and chairs. And you have set the whole house in order. Take the women outside between the roundhouse and the courtyard fence. Slash them with your swords until they are forgotten their secret lovemaking with the suitors. Then finish them off. Thus Odysseus. And the women came in, huddled together and shedding salt tears. First they carried out the dead bodies and set them down under the courtyard's portico, propping them against each other. Odysseus himself kept them at it. Then he had them sponge down all of the beautiful tables and chairs. Telemachus, the swineherd, and the cowherd scraped the floor with hose, and the women carried out the scrapings and threw them away. When they had set the whole house in order, they took the women out between the round house and the courtyard fence, penning them in with no way to escape. And Telemachus, in his cool-headed way, said to the others, I won't allow a clean death for these women, the suitor's sluts, who have heaped reproaches upon my head and upon my mother's. He spoke and tied the cable of a dark prowed ship to a great pillar and pulled it about the round house, stretching it high so their feet 
couldn't touch the ground. Long-winged thrushes or doves making their way to their roosts they sometimes fall into a snare set in a thicket and the bed that receives them is far from welcome. So too these women, their heads hanging in a row, the cable looped around each of their necks. It was a most piteous death. Their feet fluttered for a little while, but not for long. Then they brought Melanthius, the faithless goat herd, outside. And in their fury, they sliced off his nose and ears with cold bronze and pulled his genitals out by the root. Raw meat for the dogs. And chopped off his hands and feet. This done, they washed their own hands and feet and went back into their master's great hall. Then Odysseus said to Eurycleia, Bring me sulfur, old woman, and fire, so that I can fumigate the hall. And go tell Penelope to come down here, and all of the women in the house as well. And Eurycleia, the faithful nurse, as you say, child, but first, let me bring you a tunic and a cloak for you to put on. You should not be standing here like this with rags on your body. It's not right. Odysseus, his mind teeming, answered her. First make a fire for me here in the hall. He spoke, and Eurycleia did as she was told. She brought fire and sulfur, and Odysseus purified his house, the halls, and the courtyard. Then the old nurse went through Odysseus' beautiful house, telling the women. They came from their hall with torches in their hands and thronged around Odysseus and embraced him. And as they kissed his head, and shoulders and hands, he felt a sudden sweet urge to weep, for in his heart he knew them all. The old woman laughed as she went upstairs to tell her mistress that her husband was home. She ran up the steps, lifting her knees high, and bending over Penelope, she said, wake up. Dear child, so you can see for yourself what you have yearned for day in and day out. Odysseus has come home to all this time and has killed those men who tried to marry you and ravaged your house and bullied your son. And Penelope, alert now and wary. Dear nurse, the gods have driven you crazy. The gods can make even the wise mad, just as they often make the foolish wise. Now they have wrecked your usually solemn mind. Why do you mock me and my sorrowful heart waking me from sleep to tell me this nonsense? And such a sweet sleep, it sealed my eyelids. I haven't slept like that since the day Odysseus left for Ilion, that accursed city. Now go back down to the hall. If any of the others had told me this and waken me from sleep, I would have sent her back with something to be sorry about. You can thank your old age for this, at least. And Eurycleia, the loyal nurse. I am not mocking you, child, Odysseus really is here. He's come home, just as I say. He's the stranger they all insulted in the great hall. Telemachus has known all along, but had the self-control to hide his father's plans until he could pay the arrogant bastards back. 
Penelope felt a sudden pang of joy. She leapt from her bed and flung her arms around the old woman, and with tears in her eyes, she said to her, Dear nurse, if it is true, if he really has come back to his house, tell me how he laid his hands on the shameless suitors, one man alone against all of that mob. And Eurycleia answered her, I didn't see and didn't ask. I only heard the groaning of men being killed. We women sat in the far corner of our quarters, trembling, with the good solid doors bolted shut, till your son came from the hall to call me, Telemachus. His father had sent him to call me. And there he was, Odysseus, standing in a sea of dead bodies, all piled up on top of each other on the hard-packed floor. It would have warmed your heart to see him spattered with blood and filth like a lion. And now the bodies are all gathered together at the gates, and he is purifying the house with sulfur and has built a great fire and has sent me to call you. Come with me now, so that both your hearts can be happy again. You have suffered so much, but now your long desire has been fulfilled. He has come home himself, alive to his own hearth, and has found you and his son in his hall. As for the suitors who did him wrong, he's taken his revenge on every last man. And Penelope, ever cautious. Dear nurse, don't gloat over them yet. You know how welcome the sight of him would be to us all, and especially to me and the son he and I bore. But this story can't be true, not the way you tell it. One of the immortals must have killed the suitors, angry at their arrogance and evil deeds. They respected no man, good or bad, so their blind folly has killed them. But Odysseus is lost, lost to us here, and gone forever. And Eurycleia, the faithful nurse. Child, how can you say this? Your husband is here at his own fireside, and yet you are sure he will never come home, always on guard. But here's something else, clear proof. The scar he got from the tusk of that boar. I noticed it when I was washing his feet and wanted to tell him, but he shrewdly clamped his hand on my mouth and wouldn't let me speak. Just come with me, and I will stake my life on it. If I am lying, you can torture me to death. Still wary, Penelope replied, Dear nurse, it is hard for you to comprehend the ways of the eternal gods, wise as you are. Still, let us go to my son, so that I may see the suitors dead and the man who killed them. And Penelope descended the stairs, her heart in turmoil. Should she hold back and question her husband? Or should she go up to him, embrace him, and kiss his hands and head. She entered the hall, crossing the stone threshold, and sat opposite Odysseus in the firelight beside the farther wall. He sat by a column, 
looking down, waiting to see if his incomparable wife would say anything to him when she saw him. She sat a long time in silence, wondering. She would look at his face and see her husband, but then fail to know him in his dirty rags. Telemachus couldn't take it anymore. Mother, how can you be so hard, holding back like that? Why don't you sit next to Father, talk to him, ask him things? No other woman would have the heart to stand off from her husband who has come back after 20 hard years to his country at home. But your heart is always colder than stone. And Penelope, cautious as ever, my child, I am lost in wonder and unable to speak or ask a question or look him in the eyes. If he really is Odysseus come home, the two of us will be sure of each other, very sure. There are secrets between us no one else knows. Odysseus who had borne much, smiled, and his words flew to his son on wings. Telemachus, let your mother test me here in our hall. She will soon see more clearly. Now, because I'm dirty and wearing rags, she's not ready to acknowledge who I am. But you and I have to devise a plan. When someone kills even just one man, a man who has few to avenge him, he goes into exile, leaving country and kin. Well, we have killed a city of young men, the flower of Ithaca. Think about that. And Telemachus, in his clear-headed way, oh, you should think about it, Father. They say no man alive can match you for cunning. We'll follow you for all we are worth, and I don't think we'll fail for lack of courage. And Odysseus, the master strategist, well, this is what I think we should do. First, bathe yourselves and put on clean tunics and tell the women to choose their clothes well. Then have the singer pick up his lyre and lead everyone in a lively dance to him. Loud and clear, and anyone who hears the sound, a passerby or a neighbor, will think it's a wedding. And so word of the suitor's killing won't spread down through the town before we can reach our woodland farm. Once there, we'll see what kind of luck the Olympian gives us. They did as he said. The men bathed and put on tunics, and the women dressed up. And the godlike singer, sweeping his hollow lyre, put a song in their hearts and made their feet move, and the great hall resounded under the tread of men and silken-waisted women dancing. And people outside would hear it and say, well, someone has finally married the queen, fickle woman couldn't bear to keep the house for her true husband until he came back. But they had no idea how things actually stood. Odysseus, meanwhile, was being bathed by the housekeeper, Eurynome. She rubbed him with olive oil and threw about him a beautiful cloak and tunic. And Athena shed beauty upon him and made him look taller and more muscled, and made his hair tumble down his head like hyacinth flowers. Imagine a craftsman overlaying silver with pure gold. He has learned his art from Pallas Athena and Lord Hephaestus. 
and creates works of breathtaking beauty. So Athena herself made Odysseus head and shoulders shiver with grace. He came from the bath like a god and sat down on the chair again opposite his wife and spoke to her and said, you're a mystery to me. The gods have given to you more than to any other woman an unyielding heart. No other woman would be able to endure standing off from her husband and come back after 20 hard years to his country and home. Nurse, make up a bed for me so I can lie down alone since her heart is a cold lump of iron. And Penelope, cautious and wary. You're a mystery to me. I'm not being proud or scornful, nor am I bewildered, not at all. I know very well what you look like when you left Ithaca on your longward ship. Nurse, bring the bed out from the master bedroom, the bedstead he made himself, and spread it for him with fleeces and blankets and silky coverlets. She was testing her husband. Odysseus, who had borne much, could bear no more. And he cried out to his wife, God, woman, now you've cut deep. Who moved my bed? It would be hard for anyone, no matter how skilled, to move it. God could come down and move it easily, but not a man alive, however young and strong, could ever pry it up. There's something telling about how that bed's built, and no one else built it but me. There was an olive tree growing on the building site for our house, long-leaved and full, its trunk thick as a post. I built my bedroom around that tree, and when I had finished the masonry walls and done the roofing and set in the jointed, close-fitting doors, I lopped off all of the olive's branches, trimmed the trunk from the root on up, and rounded it and trued it with an adze until I had myself a bedpost. I bored it with an auger, and starting from this, I framed up the whole bed, inlaying it with gold and silver and ivory, and stretching across it ox hide thongs dyed purple. So there's our secret. But I do not know, woman, whether my bed is still firmly in place or if some other man has cut through the olive's trunk. At this, Penelope finally let go. Odysseus had shown he knew their old secret. In tears, she ran straight to him, threw her arms around him, kissed his face, and said, Don't be angry with me, Odysseus. You of all men know how the world goes. It is the gods who gave us sorrow, the gods who begrudged us a life together, enjoying our youth and arriving side by side to the threshold of old age. Don't hold it against me that when I first saw you, I didn't welcome you as I do now. My heart has been cold with fear that an imposter would come and deceive me. There are many, many who scheme for ill-gotten gains. Not even Helen, daughter of Zeus, would have slept with a foreigner had she known the Greeks would go to war to bring her back home. It was a god 
and drove her to that dreadful act, or she never would have thought of doing what she did. The horror that brought suffering to us as well. But now, since you have confirmed the secret of our marriage bed, which no one has ever seen, only you and I and a single servant, Octor's daughter, whom my father gave me before I even came here, and who kept the doors of our bridal chain. You have persuaded even my stubborn heart. This brought tears from deep within him. And as he wept, he clung to his beloved wife. Land is a welcome sight to men swimming for their lives after Poseidon has smashed their ship in heavy seas. Only a few of them escape and make it to shore. They come out of the gray water crusted with brine, glad to be alive and set foot on dry land. So welcome a sight was her husband to her. She would not loosen her white arms from his neck, and rose-fingered dawn would have risen on their weeping, had not Athena stepped in and held back the long night at the end of its course, and stopped gold-stitched dawn at ocean shores from yoking the horses that bring light to men, Lampus and Phaethon, the colts of dawn. Then Odysseus said to his wife, we have not yet come to the end of our trials. There is still a long, hard task for me to complete. As the spirit of Tiresias foretold to me on the day I went down to the house of Hades to ask him about my companion's return and my own. But come to bed now and we'll close our eyes in the pleasure of sleep. And Penelope calmly answered him, your bed is ready for you whenever you want it, now that the gods have brought you home to your family and native land. But since you brought it up, tell me about this trial. I'll learn about it soon enough and it won't be any worse to hear it now. And Odysseus, his mind teeming. You are a mystery to me. Why do you insist I tell you now? Well, here's the whole story. It's not a tale you'll enjoy, and I have no joy in telling it. Tiresias told me that I must go to city after city carrying a broad-bladed oar, until I come to men who know nothing of the sea, who eat their food unsalted and have never seen red proud ships or the oars that wing them along. And he told me that I would know I had found them when I met another traveler who thought the oar I was carrying was a winnowing fan. Then I must fix my oar in the earth and offer sacrifice to Lord Poseidon, a ram, a bull, and a boar in its prime. Then, at last, I am to come home and offer grand sacrifice to the immortal gods who hold high heaven, to each in turn. And death shall come to me from the sea. It's a gentle as this touch, and take me off when I am worn out in sleek old age with my people prosperous around me. All this Tiresias said would come true. Then Penelope, watching him, answered, if the gods are going to grant you a happy old age, there is hope your troubles will someday be over. And while they spoke to one another, 
Your enemy and the nurse made the bed by torchlight, spreading it with soft coverlets. Then the old nurse went to her room to lie down, and your enemy, who kept the bedroom, led the couple to their bed, lighting the way. When she had led them in, she withdrew, and they went with joy to their bed and to their rituals of old. Telemachus and his men stopped dancing, stopped the women's dance, and lay down to sleep in the shadowy halls. After Odysseus and Penelope had made sweet love, they took turns telling stories to each other. She told him all that she had to endure as the fair lady in the palace, looking upon the loathsome throng of suitors who used her as an excuse to kill many cattle, whole flocks of sheep, to empty the cellar of much of its wine. And Odysseus told her of all the suffering he had brought upon others and all the pain he endured himself. She loved listening to him and did not fall asleep till he had told the whole tale. He began with how he overcame the Cyclones and then came to the land of the Lotus Eaters and all that the Cyclops did and how he paid him back for eating his comrades. Then how he came to Aeolus who welcomed him and sent him on his way, but since it was not his destiny to return home then, the storm winds grabbed him and swept him off, groaning deeply on the teeming salt water. Then how he came to the Lystragonians, who destroyed his ships and all their crews, leaving him with only one black tarred hull. Then all of Circe's tricks and wiles, and how he sailed to the dank house of Hades to consult the spirit of Theban Tiresias, and saw his old comrades there, and his aged mother, who nursed him as a child. Then how he heard the sirens' eternal song, and came to the clashing rocks and dread Charybdis and Scylla, where no man had ever escaped before. Then how his crew killed the cattle of the sun, and how Zeus, the high lord of thunder, slivered his ship with lightning, and all his men went down, and he alone survived. And then he told her how he came to Ogygia, the island of the nymph Calypso, who kept him there in her scalloped caves, yearning for him to be her husband, and how she took care of him and promised to make him immortal and ageless all of his days, but did not persuade the heart in his breast. Then how he crawled out of the sea in Phaeacia, and how the Phaeacians honored him like a god and sent him home on a ship to his own native land with gifts of bronze and clothing and gold. He told the story all the way through. And then sleep, that slackens our bodies, fell upon him and released him from care. That's where the Hellenistic Greeks were convinced the Odyssey ended, and it does make a very good ending. There is another book to the Odyssey as we have it. The souls of the suitors are brought down to Hades where they see Achilles and Agamemnon and the boys talking things over in the war of Troy. And he goes out into the fields and finds his own father. And it's a beautiful recognition scene. And then the relatives of the suitors come in a throng to attack. The last we see of Odysseus is he's charging forward like a lion in battle. And Zeus throws a thunderbolt at the feet of Pallas Athena and enforces a lasting peace. But we can stop right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
so much. Professor Lombardo has agreed to answer questions for anyone who has some, so please. Any kind of question. Yes. How many languages do you speak? English. It's the only language I speak. <laughs> I can read classical Greek and Latin and Italian and French and German and Spanish. And I can construe Akkadian and Sanskrit. And that's about where it is. <laughs> I keep trying. It's always good to learn another language. There's, it's simply that there are poems in a lot of languages, and I can kind of make out Chinese, classical Chinese. Yes? Um, in your process of translation, what helps you get through it? Like, do you set up music, or do you have something to kind of like get you through the process? Do you do your own writing on the side in between breaks of translating? I do very little of my own writing. Uh, in the course of my life, maybe I've written a hundred poems. That's over 50 years. It's not many. I'm averaging two a year. And I'm trying to collect them and make them into a little poetry book. Um, but no, I work with the texts. Uh, I adore the texts. I do homage to the texts. I recite them out loud. Uh, and that's the first step, actually. And if I can't hear it, and really hear the music and really hear that poet's voice and feel that I understand that poet's mind and what that poet is doing, then I can't translate. So it's a matter of hearing the original voice and somehow grasping the mind that is behind you know, these works. And for me, it is very much a process of grasping the mind. So not so hard to make out the meaning of this. Anybody with a little practice can do it. So that's pretty much how I work. When I work, I work kind of like a maniac. <laughs> like, um, whenever, I, just every day, pretty much, and for hours a day. And if you do that, you actually get a lot done. You know, I, I, I recommend it. It's <laughs> and it's just what I do. It's what I do. Uh, but it's always, for, I translate for performance. And just about all of the texts, well, all of the texts that I translate were intended uh, to be read aloud uh, to an audience. And I regard my, my translation as a script as much as text on the page. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, yes. Um, you know, I read several translations of um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and I would say that your standard translation is probably the most, um, I guess, colorful and cohesive and comprehensible to a modern audience. Mm -hmm. and so I just wanted to ask, um, what is the most important thing, um, what would you say is the most important thing when it comes to conveying like the essence of a text, mm -hmm. but, you know, with translation, how you sometimes have to have to rework it a little bit to make it more yeah. comprehensible. Yeah. Well, actually, probably the most important thing is rhythm. And I work harder on the rhythms than just about anything else. And every line has to have rhythmic integrity and some kind of expressive power. And uh, it has to follow well the line before and lead into the line after. So we work with like three lines at a time. And rhythm does uh, more than most people realize in conveying tone and emotion and to create power. So I actually say that's the most important thing. So anyone who has studied the language just can get the meaning right, you know, pretty much. Um, but something has to drive. Uh, the translation. You really have to bring it to life now while completely respecting, for me, it's the ancient mind that created it. And so it is like mind to mind sort of experience uh, for me. That may sound pretentious, you know, but it's actually what I try to do. Um, and that's how I work. Yeah. But rhythm is what I work, what I pay most attention to. And I've developed rhythms over the, the years for the various kinds of 
uh, Greek, Latin, and the Italian verse. And now I'm kind of working on the Bhagavad Gita to try to get those rhythms. And not working so well so far, but I think I'll come around. <laughs> uh, but thank you for your question. Uh, yes? Well, here and then here. That's good. Yeah? Do you find that the English language lacks certain expressive words that you wish that it had when you were translating? And if so, English is a marvelous language for a poet. Just ask Shakespeare what he thought, you know, of English. <laughs> it really isn't bad at all. It doesn't have the euphony that Greek has. So I promised some of you I would recite the um, opening lines of the Odyssey in Greek so you can hear what it sounds like. So these are the first 10 lines. It's the invocation to the muse and tell us the story of Odysseus and wandered and tried to save his men and bring, bring them back home, but he couldn't because they ate the cattle of the sun, the idiots, you know, <laughs> and Zeus took away their day of return and lift the great song once again in our time. Language like that. Uh, so uh, listen to the rhythm uh, especially. Um, and just the sound. Andra moyene pimosa, polytrapon hos malapola plante, epe troyes hieron to liathron a person. Olon danthropon idenastea, kai no anegno. Honed again pantor patanalgea hon katathuman. Arnimanos hein te psukein kai nostan et a ludos heterus erus eto hiemenos per. Autun gar speteris in atastaliais in oronto, nebioi, hoi katabus uperianos eelioi o estion, autoratois in apela donos de manemar. Ton hamathenge the av bugater dios, epe kai hemin. So there's kind of a euphony there and richness of sound that English doesn't quite have or can't sustain for, uh, for long. And the whole Iliad and Odyssey sounds like that. You know? So you do what you can to, to exploit the sound effects, the rhythmic effects that are native to English language and poetry. And uh, English and American poetry have been very, very important to me since I was younger than most of the audience here. I would listen, as I was telling some of you in a class today, to uh, vinyl LPs of Dylan Thomas and Richard Burton and Albert Finney reading Shakespeare. And uh, I just couldn't get enough of it. And I would memorize this long, long, long track. So I tried to absorb all of this poetry, this English and American poetry, into my system. I had no idea I would translate. I wanted to be a poet myself. And I would write imitating these poets. I would actually try to sound like Hopkins and Shakespeare and you know, Coleridge and Eliot and everyone. Um, and that was kind of a first step to translation, imitating other poets. And in a sense, translation is some kind of imitation of an original poet. Um, but uh, I like English OK. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> yes? Uh, or you have your hand up? Yes. Maybe Izzy first and then... Um, oh, who's, okay, behind you and then you. Yes. Um, if you could be any of the Greek gods, who would you be? Because I want to be Apollo. Who's the best? <laughs> you want to be Apollo? Yeah. Well, you know, Apollo is a wonderful male god, but I'm partial to Pallas Athena. I think I would like to be Athena. Mm -hmm. you know, Zeus's favorite girl. <laughs> <laughs> And kind of Odysseus's divine alter ego. You know. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I like Athena. Um, as for which hero, which hero or male or female would you like to be? Not a god, but or a goddess. I don't know. But I I uh, I've, I've read. I mean, I read the Odyssey. And you read from the Iliad, and I don't know. I just think that some of the and um, I don't know who I would pick. I mean, Maybe none of them? <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are like okay and then they kind of do like stuff you don't like. Like yeah, well, Orpheus, you know? Yeah, Orpheus. I, I have a story about where he uh, has a, something 
called Bard's Groom. It's like a traveling posse stand in the underworld. But there's yeah, a yeah. He's actually behind it. He's like, I'm still gonna, I'm gonna get here, guys. I'm gonna get her. And the characters in the story are like, give it up, man. You shouldn't even be here. How are you still alive? It's, it's 2017. Okay. okay, so Orpheus, wonderful. <laughs> what did you have? I'm sorry, my own what? Your own, like, um, like Audio you said books. that you had, were listening to a lot of recordings of these things. I was wondering if you had done your own. Yeah, I have recorded the Iliad and the Odyssey, and they're available wherever you get things like that online. <laughs> <laughs> these days, I don't know. <laughs> uh, they're not very expensive. And I recorded them maybe six or seven years ago. They're very high quality recordings. They won a number of industry awards for how well they were done. Um, and it was sort of like, for me, that was when they were really published. You know, Homer didn't write. The texts weren't written down for a couple of centuries, maybe. They were just transmitted by professional performers who memorized it all. And then it becomes a Greek text. And then you read the Greek text and make it to an English text, but the idea of the English text is that it's a script for a performance. And so you have this symmetry, you know, from the original performance to a Greek text to an English text to an English uh, performance. Yes? Um, I was just curious what you thought about other portrayals of the ending of the Odyssey, like what Tennyson wrote. Uh, other what? I'm sorry. Like portrayals of the ending of the Odyssey, um, like Tennyson's? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I've thought a lot about that, actually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Tennyson has uh, Odysseus, uh, Ulysses, he calls it on. Ithaca, and he's about to set sail again, and you know, he's tired of his aged wife, and he's tired of meeting out justice to a savage race who hoard and feed and sleep and know not me. It's you know, a little egotistic, you know. But uh, he never actually sets forth. You know, he has this wonderful Victorian resolve to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> not a bad poem for a Victorian poem. <laughs> uh, but then Dante, you know, five centuries earlier, about right? Yeah. Uh, you know, Canto 26 of Inferno. Um, he's, he's down there imprisoned in one double horn of flame with Diomedes because of their treachery uh, in, and their role in destroying Troy, which was Rome's mother city, which is sacred to Dante. Uh, and he's made to tell his story. And it's very interesting because he has to transmit his voice through this flame. And so the tip of the flame quivers and that creates sound waves so that uh, Dante you know, can understand him and how he set forth with just one ship you know, and uh, never did go home to Penelope in Dante's version. And he sails through you know, the Straits of Gibraltar, which humans were not intended to pass beyond and into the South Atlantic. Uh, and the idea is that he's hungry for knowledge. So pretty much like Tennyson, Tennyson has Dante in mind there. You know, the utmost bounds of human thought to experience the world as has never been experienced before. Uh, but he approaches what you learn later in reading Dante in Purgatory, the island of Purgatory, and a wind comes out of the island because you're not supposed to go there when you're alive. It's only the souls of the dead who go there. And they, um, the ship cracks up and sinks. So that's a nice ending for Odysseus. Um, and then there are a couple of other sequels. There's this wonderful late 19th century uh, Italian um, poem in which he sets forth to revisit all of the old places to see if they're still real and they aren't. There's no trace of the Cyclops or anything. Uh, but he sees bones on the shore where the um, sirens were. And then the ship cracks up, and he drowns. And the blue sea takes him to Calypso. He never sees her, but she is real. And she wraps him up in her long hair and mourns Odysseus. And better never to have been born you know, than to face you know, non-existence. And so it's got this sort of existential, turn of the century, melancholy tone to it. But the great sequel is Nikos Kazantzakis, you know, who wrote Zorba the Greek. 
Uh, he wrote a 33,333-line modern Greek sequel to the Odyssey. And it's the same thing, Odysseus you know, leaves Penelope and sails off, and he sails down to Sparta to see if Menelaus is interested in any more action, and he's fat and lazy, but Helen is ready for action, so she sails off with Odysseus, and he doesn't want her really. He marries her off to some blonde Dorian Greek to get a new age, and he goes down to Egypt and uh, encounters the Pharaoh. He becomes like Moses. He leads his people out. He founds a utopian city on the banks of the Nile. It, there's an earthquake, and it sinks into oblivion on its inaugural day. And then he becomes a great ascetic and wanders from Egypt all the way down to the bottom of Africa, and he encounters on his way a young Christ-like fisherman, a Buddha type, and all sorts of other spiritual icons. And finally, he, an iceberg floats up at Cape Horn, and he boards it, and that's his last ship, the ship of death, before his mind is going to leap to the peak of its holy freedom, and he becomes pure spirit. But before that happens, he yells, and he calls out to all of his old companions, and they all hear him, those who are still alive. And Helen hears him, and she's now 90 years old, and she's dying, and she's lying on the banks of the Eurotus River by Sparta. And when she hears the cry of the world destroyer, which is his main epithet in Kazantzakis, she lifts herself up on one elbow and says, Dear God, if only I could wreck my home once more and stand, <laughs> at a great wish, and stand in the prow of a ship and feel the wind in my face. Anyway, that's a wonderful sequel. <laughs> <laughs> I like these sequels. Yeah, they're cool, most of them, one way or another. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Okay, but that's all we have time so for. Much. Thank you very much. We have a wonderful, wonderful institution here. I know, I know you all realize that. I'm truly impressed with everyone I've met here. Please, take advantage of it. Thank you.